Okay, we're in the company of Mark Schwarzer of Fulham, formerly of Middlesbrough and Bradford and Kaiserslautern and Dresden, would you believe, and no doubt some teams in Australia as well. And he's still going, aged, well, he's got to be well into his 50s by now, I, I would <laughs> have quite. thought. Not quite, not quite. Now, most obvious question, you're an Aussie. Yep, of You've course. had a massively successful career in football, but um, it's not the first sport that comes to mind uh, when you're back home in Australia, surely. No, definitely not. Um, where I grew up was actually pretty much in the heartland of rugby league. Uh, but coming from a German immigrant family, um, there was no way I was going to be playing or allowed to play rugby league. Uh, so football was always, or soccer as we called it back then, was always uh, first priority and it was one that my parents were, were happy for me to play. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love playing rugby league, I love playing cricket, um, all sports. And uh, I tried, I played them for a, a season or so. Um, Loved it. Got asked to play representative sides or try out for representative sides, but always said that, and particularly rugby league. Um, my parents signed permission uh, slip for me to play one particular time, and they said never again. So I have to admit, I did uh, sort of practice their head signature, and I played for the rest of the season for the school, and got asked to play representative for, uh, rugby league, and just said, listen, I can't. My parents knew I was even playing; I'd be killed. So uh, yeah, I loved I loved all sports. I love playing all sports. But if you get the chance, even though you're up here, you'll you'll watch the state of origin. Yeah, of and... course, if I can. Yeah, without a doubt. And, if, and particularly if Australia's playing, I'll watch Australia play anything. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be any of the main sports. It can be anything as long as Australia's playing. I'll watch it. <laughs> okay. Now, second question is: So you've chosen football, which is uh, a little bit odd, considering you're Australian. Even odder, there are eleven positions in a football team. You chose the mad one. Why? Well, I can't take credit for that. My dad has to take credit for putting me in goals. Um, when I was when I was ten years old, my dad was a, uh, the coach of the team, and nobody wanted to go in goals. So uh, he said uh, I had to go in goals. I always put it down to the fact that he was the coach. I was his son, and, and I had to do as he's told. Um, he, believe, he he still sticks to the, to that today. That uh, I used to trip over my own two feet, and that's why he put me in goals. Okay. Do you see yourself as a handy uh, outfield player? Do you get ever get the chance uh, at training to show I, off? I know I'm not a handy outfield player anymore, and I've got no chance to be a handy outfield player anymore in comparison to all the young guys running around. Um, but you know, I used to in Germany when I was in Germany, I didn't play a lot in goals because I was number three goalkeeper and uh, at training a lot. I used to play out in the field and I did score a lot of goals in small sided games. So uh, I, I, I can strike a decent ball. How's your German? Yeah, it's very good. Fluent? Yes. Yeah, I speak, it, I speak it just about every day. We've got five players or so in our team that speak all German. Um, throughout my whole career, I've always spoken uh, to various teammates in German. So my wife speaks German as well. So we, we, uh, you know, I do, I do, I enjoy, I enjoy speaking German. I speak as much as possible. So you can speak English, German, and Australian. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Sorry, a bit obvious. Um, all right, now then, you played for Dresden. You played for Kaiserslautern. So that, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, well, it was it was uh, from my heritage. I've got a German passport, so when I went over in 1994, it was pre the European Union or the forming of the European Union. So it was one country I could go to and not be a foreigner. And as a goalkeeper, an unknown goalkeeper, obviously it was more it was easier easier, so to speak, to get into a place like Germany rather than trying my luck in England straight away and then have to be classed as one of the foreigners. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I started there. You know, I, I think. Partly it was a, an ambition to also try and play in Germany, and with my dad an ambition that I would play in Germany one day as well. And um, you know, I, I had a, a very interesting time, and uh, I'd say I, I learnt a lot from that experience, and it was something I wouldn't change for anything because the experience was invaluable. Um, and I think it put me in a, in a great position to to uh, seize the opportunity once it came along. You're half German. Yep. You're Australian, well, half Australian. Yep. I guess. Uh, but you've lived here for years and years and yes, years. I have. So in Germany, you play England and football. Who are you who are you rooting for? Germany, <laughs> of course. You know you can't. Blood, blood's Germany play Australia. Australia. Oh, okay. Yeah, Australia first and foremost. I mean, I, I, for the very first time um, in 2010 at the World Cup, we played against Germany. Right. So that was a very special moment in, in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, it was a very disappointing moment because we lost 4-0. Mm. Um, but it was the first time we played them in a World Cup. We played them one time previously and I played against them in the Confederations Cup. Uh, but it was the first time we played at a major tournament against them in a, in a competition. And uh, it was uh, it was an amazing experience, but one that I don't look back too fondly because of the result. 
A uh, quick word about uh, the other clubs. Bradford was your first in this country. You, you've got to be pleased that they're, well, they're not there yet, but uh, they're, they've got to Wembley again for a second second time this yeah, season. Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, they've had an unbelievable season, really. To, to just make the, the League Cup final this season, as they did, was, was phenomenal. Um, you know, I've, even though I was only here for a very, very short period of time, I, I, you know, it was probably, it was the first time in a long time that I really started to enjoy my football again, and, and I loved every minute of being at Bradford City. Um, and believe it or not, Chris Kamara was the manager at the time. Was he? He okay. was. And uh, Paul Jewell was the... the Whatever happened coach. to him, eh? Hey? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whatever's happened to him, we, we don't know. No. Uh, no, I mean, you know, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed my time there. Um, it, in, in one sense, I was a little bit disappointed it didn't last any longer. On the other hand, obviously, it was another opportunity for me when I, once I left Bradford City to, to go to Middlesbrough and play in the Premier League. Well, Middlesbrough, you were there for, for decades and decades. I think I'm right <laughs> in saying you, you still, to this day, uh, hold the record for the longest serving foreigner and one premiership club, correct? I think that's correct. Yeah, still, you beat yes. Dennis Bergkamp. He was that's quite right. handy, wasn't he? He was. He wasn't a bad player in his day. So happy days at, at Middlesbrough, uh, which included, I believe, winning the League Cup that's and right. reaching and losing the uh, UEFA, UEFA, UEFA Cup final. Cup final, final yeah. Yeah, Pretty good for a team like Middlesbrough, though. Yeah, we did really well. I mean, it was, uh, um, we, I think we stayed in the Premier League for about 11 seasons. Um, so it was the most uh, stable time of the club's history and the most successful time of the club's history in mini winning its first major trophy. So you know it was it was great times. I had a really good time there, and and uh, you know we we as a team over the over the years we accomplished quite a lot. And um, it's a little bit disappointing to see them where they are now, um, but hopefully one day they'll get back up to the top line. Yeah. And and Fulham, in a sense, is a sort of a similar size of club, um, very traditional. Successful, uh, not a Man United, but uh, but pretty good. Again, you reached another what is now Europa League, isn't it? Yes, final, that's right. yep. and uh, you've had good times there. Yeah, we have. You know, we've I think in the certainly holding your own, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you know the club's done really, really well, particularly in the last five years. Oh. I, mean, I can only vouch for the last five years that I've been at the club, and uh, you know the first two years in particular under Roy Hodgson and Mike Kelly, and uh, um, it was just you know Ray Lovington as well was there. It was a fantastic period of time. You know, we we finished seventh off the back of the club almost going down um, the season before and then qualifying for the, for the Europa League um, and having a tremendous season, you know, getting all the way to the final and yeah. unfortunately losing out. But, you know, it was an amazing journey. It was an amazing accomplishment for a club like Fulham. And, um, you know, we were so close but so far and, you know, you wouldn't, tra you know, wouldn't trade any of those experiences for anything. OK, a few quick fire questions at you, OK? Uh, your own personal favourite save that, that you've made over the years? You, you've made a few, I would imagine. Anyone that stands out? Um, it's difficult, you know. I, I never really categorise them as the best save or favourite saves. I put them down to probably more significant. And for me, there's there's no no two words about it. There's two saves I made um, in 2005 in the penalty shootout for Australia, where we beat Uruguay and we qualified for the first time in 32 years for a World Cup. That I put down to the two most significant saves. Um, John Aloisi was another very very famous Australian. Had to still slot away the. The, the, the next penalty, which he did very easily and very calmly, um, well, which seemed from afar very easily and very calmly, um, and you know the rest is history, as they say. And, and for me, that they're two most significant. So. Best best save you've seen from a, from another goalkeeper? Um, it'd probably be Peter Schmeichel's save um, from when he was playing for Man United, where he basically dived full stretch. I think it was to his left and clawed the ball back out again. Mm. It was a phenomenal one-handed save, and uh, there's some great pictures flying around of him mm. of him doing that. You may be biased, but uh, in, in the week that uh, the great man, Sir Alex, has finally retired, people are talking about his great signings and they, they talk about the big, big money signings. But for me, honestly, I'd say possibly Schmeichel. Yeah, he's, you know, he went on to be, I think his early doors were very, very, very tough for him. He, and he, he didn't have the best of times when he first went there, but which is fully understandable of a, of a club like Man United and you know, coming from the Danish league across, you know, it was a, a massive big step up for him. But from that point onwards, he, you know, he went on to become the best goalkeeper by a long shot in the world of his time and uh, you know, he would go down as regarded as probably one of the best all-time goalkeepers that Man United ever, ever had playing for him um, and uh, for me in particular you know, he, was a, he was someone I looked up to and, and uh, admired you know, hugely. And around your dining table at home if you could have four goalies sitting around the table who would they be? Uh, but in terms of greatness, perhaps in your own opinion, not necessarily your mates or the funniest yeah, or whatever um, but just the, the four greats yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I suppose I'd, I'd look at Jean-Marie Faf, who was someone that I really admired and, and, and loved watching play. Um, I would have to say um, Peter Schmeichel. And then 
um, probably uh, Oliver Kahn would be an interesting one, without a doubt. And then I would probably say uh, someone like Gordon Banks. Mm. Mm. You didn't name his save? No, no, it was a tremendous save. It was pretty it? good, it was, wasn't it? It was amazing. And yeah. quite significant, by the way. Yeah, a little bit, little bit of sneakiness went behind that one as yeah. well. Yeah, okay. Now, um, you're a big lad, you can look after yourself, but, but who, who's been the centre forward? Who's who's you know made you have a little think when you wake up in the morning and you get to face him? Who, who's been the one who's there's, quite tough? Yeah, there's a few over the years, you know. Mm. Like you know, Alan Shearer was one of those people that you know you might you would say he technically wasn't the best player going around, but you know his knack for scoring goals anywhere across the field it was, was was phenomenal. Um, playing for Newcastle at the time as well, you know there was a lot of rivalry between Newcastle and Middlesbrough, so there was mm. always that that part of it. Um, Kevin Phillips playing for Sunderland with Noel Quinn as his partner, whereas another one, again, a lot of that was down to the rivalry between the two clubs as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, you look over the years and you think of uh, Henri, you know, when he had the ball, and he, even when he got the ball, he's uh, probably the most dangerous period of time when Henri ever had the ball was when he was in his own half, mm. with his back to our goal. <laughs> right. And he knew that if he turned yeah. and opened up those legs, yeah. there was li very little stopping him. Yeah. Um, it was a one-to-one, -one, you know, when obviously you're advancing, the, 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 yep. somebody's bearing down on you. Who was the toughest one to read? Henri, I guess, would be one of them. He was very tough, yeah. I mean, his, yeah. his sheer pace and his, his, mm. and his uh, level of skill on the ball was, mm. was phenomenal. I mean, Ronaldo, I remember Ronaldo playing for Man United and I played at Millsborough one year and he, he came on one-on-one -on -one with me and got around me. Mm. Um, well, he kind of got around me and then the ball went out of his grasp a little bit and he, he dived. I actually didn't touch him. Mm. And shown on the replays and everything, and the referee gave a penalty. And I said to the referee afterwards, I said to him, I actually said to him at the time, I said, you've made a big mistake, and you'll be told, you'll see it when you get home. I actually saw him a couple of weeks later, and he said, my wife had a proper go at me that I gave that the decision that it wasn't a penalty. And, and he said, I apologise. You know, these things happen. But mm. yeah, he was another one that, you know, the unpredictability. Mm. He didn't get the goal like that, did you? No, but they scored the penalty, so unfortunately. There we go. Um, how long have you got left? Um, Not trying to, uh, you know, uh, no, I mean, my, my retire ambition, you. Yeah, my ambition is to play at least another year. Um, right. You know, hopefully we're going to qualify for the World Cup in Australia yeah. for Brazil, and uh, I definitely see myself playing another year at least. That'd be your third World Cup. It would be, yes. And at the moment, you're on 105 Five. caps. 105 caps for Australia. Congratulations. Thank you very much.